so somehow when we started doing the schedule, I'm, I'm one of the organizers, but somehow the others decided to put me to do advanced architectures. Um, and, I, and I kind of had to figure out what that means. Um, not exactly sure myself, but you know, I, I thought like, okay, so when it comes, okay, so maybe for the, for the picture, so that's the guys you call if you get stuck on the motorway. So, you know, like advanced architectures are supposed to man to, 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 you know, come help you do things that you probably can't do otherwise. It's not clear that, that that's the outcome of this talk, but um, yeah, I guess sort of one fundamental question is what are advanced architectures or are, why do we talk about architectures uh, so much? Um, and then for that, we have to go back in time, right? We need to understand sort of how machine learning evolved. So I'm going to do sort of this little bit of historical context of sorts and then kind of actually jump into an architecture and discuss it because I think that's what you guys want me to do. Um, so why do we care about um, architecture design? Um, so how does machine learning works? Uh, so I'm going to give you like a very condensed biased perspective on that, but Roughly speaking, for parametric models, which is what we're going to generally talk about, uh, what you do, what, what you have is a function h that goes from some parameters and some, some input domain to some target domain in supervised learning, right? And um, so you have this, this class of models, and what you want to do is you want to find a good predictor within that class, right? So we have some function. Um, I hope I have that on the next slide. No, uh, maybe. So you have some function. Um, and this, this function, this H, defines the architecture. So this is sort of where you define the architecture. Uh, for example, a linear model, you know, H of theta x is just theta times x. And then you have the learning process. And the learning process is just some search process where you're saying, like, I, I need to find this, some theta value, theta star, such that now when I apply H with the theta star to any input, it gives me the correct answer, whatever that is. And, and that's sort of roughly how how um, a big chunk of, of ML works. Um, and I think in the community there tends to be two angles that people think about when they think about H. So the question is, okay, how do we pick an H? How do we define H? Um, and usually there are two angles. So one angle is expressivity. Uh, so that is, okay, how diverse is this set of functions? So if I'm trying to like change theta there, what kind of functions do I get out of it? And are those functions useful for me? Uh, so that's kind of the expressivity angle, and then there's the learnability angle, which is about like, okay, how am I going to do this search, and what kind of things can I find doing this search given, to, given the function age? Um, and it turned out that for a long while, the best way to get something out of the model is just to play with age. So there's this sort of like, if you look at a, I try to Google and look up um, sort of history of, of, of architectures and machine learning and whatnot, and usually there's always centered around architectures, right? We start, had Boltzmann machines, we had MLPs, we had convolutional neural networks, LSTMs, and so forth, but usually it's always about the architecture. People don't talk, it's like, oh, we had SGD, and at this point we switched to Adam or whatnot, um, because the feeling is that the architecture mat matters a lot, and that's why I think there's still this strong bias nowadays when we're talking about new things, we're always asking, okay, what's new to the architecture? We, we rarely ask what's new to the learning process. But I think, and Sander, who I guess is not here, would probably argue for that. So there's now like a very strong um, feeling about sort of this data-centric view. It's becoming very popular, where when you start talking with these folks that are developing really large-scale models, they will say, Actually, nowadays, I play with the model and, and nothing changes, right? The most important thing that I can do is play with the data. And, and I wanted to talk a little bit about this interplay. So for a long time, from the early 90s to very recently, it seemed that every time you want to get something more out of your architecture, the best thing was to play with the architecture, add a layer, change some activation function, do some, some stuff there. Nowadays, there is more and more this belief that actually, you know, transformer is all you need. I think I had a slide on that, but anyway, you, transformer is all you need, and you just like need to pump more data, find more data, find more compute, play a bit with the data, change a bit distribution, and, and that will get you um, where you want. Uh, yeah, I had a slide on this. So, so yeah, so the top is the model centric. The bottom is the, 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 the data centering perspective where you say just pick any model, froze it, make it as big as you can, and then just throw data at it. Um, we started having workshops about this. There were 
like keynote, ICML, I know, I know um, Mihaila Van den Schaar had like a thing about data centric where it had lots of people. So it's really becoming like a kind of a mainstream perspective of how we should do AI on uh, from now on. And it's more like, okay, we need to focus on, on, on the data and not so much on the model because it's not that important. So I wanted to like, yeah, kind of take a step back and say how I think about this. So, so like what's going on there? So I think usually what's happening is you have the set of all possible functions that you can think of. Um, and then you pick an H, and then H decides, you know, what functions you can represent, and is this sort of like weird shape. And then you, you pick a searching process or learning algorithm and a starting point for your learning algorithm, and that further defines a much smaller set of functions that you can actually reach, right? So you have the function you can express with H, and then you have the reachable functions that you can get by, by using learning starting from some, some, some starting point. Um, and I guess the point that I'm going to try to, to convey is that um, usually both of these things matter quite a bit, and, and they're all techniques to introduce inductive biases in your learning. Um, and um, for, for better or worse, we're in a place where uh, picking H to be a, a big architecture, not necessarily a transformer, but a big architecture that gives you a really large set of functions that you can represent. Um, and you have quite a bit of wiggle room by playing with the learning process and um, playing with it by, by messing up with the data. Because you have other ways to play to the, with the learning process. You can play with the optimizer itself and so forth. And those will have effects. I'm going to talk about that. Um, but you, you can get a lot of mileage by just playing with the data. Um, OK. Uh, oh, sorry. But, um, uh, but, but obviously, there are things, um, and that may be kind of important, there are things that, that you should know. So like when you're, we're changing the, the reachable function h, those can never go outside of the functions we can express. So if we are to think about architectures, maybe the right angle, and that's kind of what I'm going to try to, to go to at some point, is to think about are there some particular functions that we really need to represent, and are those outside the set? And if they're outside the set, then there's nothing we can do with the data to get there. Um, and, 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 and that can be important, um, and, and it's worth thinking that sense. So, you know, like we, we believe transformer is, is a big class, it can do a lot of things. Um, if you want to, in a very pragmatic, constructive way, propose something nowadays that might do something that transformers can't do, um, you need to be a bit more explicit about the tra what transformers can do. Uh, because otherwise, you're going to get lost. So in this very large-scale regime, you're going to get lost in, you know, comparing numbers doesn't mean anything almost. You know, it's really hard to do anything. So, so you need to think a bit more, I think, um, f formally about this and, and have a good plan of why you're doing what you're doing. Um, I wanted to say that, because um, this took me a little by surprise, we, we had a work on this. So, you know, people like, you know, I like this kind of diagrams. Uh, to, to me, they're intuitive. But, but you have to realize that when you're playing with H or when you're playing with the learning algorithm, it's not just the shape of these things that you can change. You can actually change the geometry of the space, and this is what the next slide was supposed to be. Um, so what you can do is you can make paths between points within that region to be, you know, the distance to be smaller or shorter because basically you're bending the manifold if you guys like geometry and all those kind of stuff. Um, and just to kind of give you an example, there's this paper, just like a random example, the paper I was on, 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 on power propagation where what you do is you can show that you can reparameterize um, uh, your, your function h such that when you do gradient descent, actually solutions that are sparse are just closer to you and you just converge to them. So you haven't changed the set of minima or the, the set of functions that you can represent. You can show that there is a one-to-one -one mapping from the set before and the current set, so you haven't messed up with the, you know, with the shape of that thing, so to say, you've just changed the interesting geometry of the space, right? So you move the points around and you make certain points to be closer to you and, and certain points to be further. Um, and I just wanted to bring this up because I don't see it being talked about that much. So people always, when they talk about regularization, they're talking about restricting the set of functions you can represent and saying like, oh, okay, you know, we're gonna throw away some things. Um, that's not the only thing you can do. So one thing that I think is quite interesting is that you can think about how you regularize or reparameterize or however you wanna phrase it, the architecture in such a way that you change the structure of how the, 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 the you know, you make things that you like to be closer to you and, and, and that kind of um, can, can, can be quite helpful. Um, 
Um, and um, this is particularly interesting because, you know, we know, I mean, this is my interpretation. I guess everyone has heard about double descent. It was a big thing, you know, and this is my interpretation of how it works. But, um, I mean, initially when, when Balkin introduced his work, I thought a lot of people in the community used to say that what he's really saying is that as you grow the capacity of the model, the capacity itself becomes like an L2 regularizer, forces you to small norm solutions. I think that's not what he's saying. So for those who don't know, I can explain a little bit what Belkin did. So we have the traditional view of, of machine learning that says, you know, as I increase the capacity of my model, if, if it is too big, then the problem that I have, usually I should start to overfit, right? Because my model is too flexible and I'm gonna start to fit any kind of noises in the data, right? So initially you just have to fit like the, the, the process itself because that has sort of maybe like lower frequency content and then, you know, as I'm increasing the model, I'm gonna start to fit any noise. And what Belkin is basically saying is that, well, if I keep growing the model, at some point this model is gonna be so overparameterized that the number of local minima is just gonna explode. And then because we're doing gradient descent, what happens, you're converging to the closest minima to you, right? Um, and that introduces a bias, which is kind of the interesting bit, right? So now, instead of having one minima, you have billions of minima in your space, and you're doing, you're walking in the space, doing gradient descent, taking small steps, and you're just gonna converge to the closest thing to you. Um, and, and because you're, uh, 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 because you're converging to the closest thing to you, and you start somewhere close to zero, you know, you get this L2 regularizer. So that's kind of the idea, right? So, I, I start close to zero, I, I move very little, so I'm gonna stop somewhere where I have the small norm, and, and you know, then Occam's razor, what's small is good, therefore I'm gonna generalize and so forth. Um, I think as, 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 as thing progresses, I think the, the important thing to remember is that you converge to the closest thing to where you start, but that is not just about small norm. So the initialization matter, the way I interpret this nowadays is just basically saying the solutions that you get, it's a functional initialization, it's not like a dynamical system that you run and then at the end when you've converged, like the, the, the convergence point has nothing to do with the starting point, the starting point always defines your solution and actually you encode a lot of information in the choice of your starting point and we'll see how that affects other things. Um, and these are like just a few examples, that, so I'm not gonna talk about this stuff but just getting some water. Um, but for example, there was this uh, paper from uh, Google Brain Fox uh, at some point, 2021, where they show that you, know, you can play with the initialization and you can get a system that gets, you know, converges perfectly on the training loss, you know, gets perfect training loss, but then it gets arbitrary performance on the test, right? So it basically says, the only reason we're generalizing is because of the initialization point. If I pick a different initialization point, and, and here the, the trick is just to change the scale of the weights on different layers, you can get to a place where you don't generalize at all. And then we have the work of, of Tudor, who's gonna talk later, so he was doing a PhD with me, and you know, like if you, for example, need to fine tune, which is what we do nowadays, um, it turns out that if you fine tune, you don't control the starting point, right? So, so then you lose a lot of the properties. So like for example, the, the, the typical experiment that um, um, Ash and Adams did was you pre-train on half of CIFAR, then you fine tune on full CIFAR and you just cannot generalize as well because that half of CIFAR like biases you, right? So, um, so this is actually quite important, particularly nowadays when you start fine tuning in these all kinds of ways. And it kind of just shows you that it doesn't matter, I mean, it is connected to data, but it's still the, the, the learning process plays a role, right? So the ordering in which I show data, potentially it's as important as the data that I show. Um, you have this non-transitivity where, you know, if you learn on X and then on Y, it's not the same thing as if you learn on Y and then on X. Uh, the other thing that I find kind of funny is we've always, you know, there was always these questions of why is stochastic gradient descent, um, and I think um, a lot of people in the early days, like Jan Le Kuhn and others, you know, had this argument that's very intuitive, which is, and, and it's still true, which is just noise, right? So if you have any powerful optimizer, it will just converge to the, the first minima you see. If you have SGD, you have the noise, and the noise will help you escape that. Um, nowadays, you know, there are papers like, like the two I've cited from, from Sam Smith and, and, and um, um, yeah, the, the other one. <laughs> um, and, and they show that actually, um, there is a bias in this process, right? So it shows that, which I, I think is high, kind of the point here, is like basically everything that you do, every decision that you take in your system, 
is going to shape somehow this set of functions that you have access to. So the point there is like, if I'm comparing gradient descent ver versus stochastic gradient descent, I can, I can show that they're actually optimizing different objectives. Where the difference is gradient descent is looking for a solution that has a minimal norm on the gradient on the whole data set, while the stochastic gradient descent you know, regularizes the norm of the gradient of every mini batches. And, and these things are different things, right? Um, a solution for one does not necessarily always have to be a solution for the other. Um, Okay, so um, yeah, this is the point I was, you know, with this little intro that I was trying to make. Basically, anything that we do in, 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 in when we're trying to do a machine learning system will affect what we can represent and how we represent it. So anything you can think as an inductive bias, and I think in some sense this is what this discussion is about. When we're thinking about architectures, modern architectures, we're talking about you know, when, we, when we're reshaping these things, we're talking about introducing some kind of inductive bias in that process, and the point here is like almost any step does that. And, and really the question, when you want to improve the system that you have, the question is, what is the easiest way to do that? You know, would it be easier to just play with the data? Would it be easier to change the architecture? Should I look at the algorithm? Um, and, and I guess sort of historically, it's always been the, the, the architecture that was the easiest way to improve. And then maybe there is some issues nowadays, at least a scale, where it turns out that it might not be the architecture the, the, the best place. But um, there are things um, that if you look at each of these components, there are things that they can do and they cannot do. And, and then maybe it's like sort of the right way to distinguish about them. So, you would go mess up with the architecture if you want some kind of change to the set of functions that you can reach that you cannot achieve by playing to the, with the data. Um, okay. So, um, and, and, and because I wanted to make this contrast, I'm gonna talk a lot about architectures because that, that was the point of the, of the talk. Uh, so, so in order to be able to do that and, and to have you guys on board and not start thinking, well, why, why should I care about these things? I wanted to say a few things that you can't do with data so that then we know what we're going for when we're gonna start playing with the architecture, right? Uh, so there's like some reasons where data is not always the best choice. The first one is kind of simple and it, you, know, it's, it's, you know, sometimes it's quite expensive to get new data or sometimes we just cannot collect the data. You know, we need to, to, to get that out of the way. Um, the second bit is the one that I said, so whatever you do with the data, you cannot increase the expressivity of the system beyond what the class of function can represent. So if we can show that the class of function we have doesn't represent some kind of computation we really care about, that's a good sign that like, we really need to change the architecture. And I think this comes into play when you know, people talk about sort of these LLMs as like a magical one that can do everything. So you can tell them like, you know, you can have as much compute as you want, but there's this one thing you can't do and you need to do something to get there. Um, and the, the thing that will actually nowadays in, when it comes to new architectures, so I'm gonna talk about state space models for those who know, so this is what my lecture was meant to be about. Um, when it comes to this particular family of architectures, then now it's like becoming very popular, like another angle that seems that people are pushing is that it's, it's not really about whether it's more expressive or whatnot. It's just you have these additional benefits that are kind of important to think about. Um, and, 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 and that's sort of where it seems that the architecture, it's really easy to show that I have these additional benefits and I'm gonna talk about. So there's always this, this additional angle. So, okay, let's, let's take all those three one by one. So um, expensive or impossible to collect. So expensive stuff, so I'm, I, there are a lot more experts here than me, but you know, when it comes to protein folding or like dealing with molecules and whatnot, getting more data can be expensive to train your system. So, so that doesn't seem to be a solution, right? So we're not this regime where you can say, well, I'm gonna get another trillion examples or whatever, and I'm gonna cover the space and everything's gonna be fine. There's a simple thing. When you're thinking about things like Go, the game, right? So you say like, I would just want to get sort of data from the optimal policy. Well, no one has the optimal policy, right? We don't know what the optimal policy is. It's impossible to get there. Even if we had it, we might not know that we have it. It's sort of like a, a, a kind of a sentence that you can't decide. Or like robotics is another simple example where if you have robotics, it's not like data is just all over the place and you can do whatever you want with it. Um, about the expressivity angle, uh, there are like a bunch of things that I think are quite important and crucial that people, uh, like systems that we have right now, they, I don't think they can deal with it very well. 
they somehow all of them kind of end up being about recursion. I like recurring neural networks, so maybe there's a bias here, but it, like neural networks are really hard to do recursion of nonlinear functions, so like a composition of G many times. Um, so one way this comes in is things like adaptive computation. This was a big topic. I think the first paper I've seen on this is yeah, it's Jan's work from 2013. That was the first I clear. It was a very inventive paper. The idea was to use a recurrent neural network to classify MNIST and to show that like, you can do as many iterations as you want, and if you do more iterations, you get better quality. It, it never got picked up, so it took a lot of years. So it took three years for there to be another paper about this, and then another, I don't know how many years, for the second paper. Um, but the whole point is, if I want my transformer to do some algorithm, so I like, say, for simplicity, to compute factorials, it should do at least this, the number of flops is required to compute that, right? So we know that the, 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 the transformer does like a fixed number of flops given the, the length of the input. So if I'm asking to compute n factorial, I make n larger, the amount of computation that it needs to do it grows much faster than the computation the transformer does. So obviously the transformer does not, cannot learn how to do n factorial unless you do something to it, right? You add chain of thought or some other kind of mechanism to try to augment the number of flops that it does. So there's like a bare minimum requirement, right? If I want to mimic some function, I should at least be able to, or I should at least do the same, um, the, the number of computation that function does, or maybe more in order to represent it. So that's kind of like a low-hanging argument that you can have when someone asks you, what can a transformer not do or whatever? You, that's one angle you can attack this. Um, there is the Turing completeness. Um, it's still not clear to me whether we care about it, we don't care about it, but you know, it's a big thing. You can see there are papers out there that say transformers are Turing complete, papers that say transformers are not Turing complete. Um, and I think you'll see a lot of this stuff in, 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 in the literature in ML. And I find that most of the time, the reason you see so many papers contradicting each other is because the semantics of the words are not fixed exactly. In particular, what's different between these papers is what is a transformer. So different papers use, look at different things and they all call them transformers. And it's kind of important to know. So the paper that says um, attention is Turing complete, um, the attention is hard attention, uh, it's not soft attention, and there's some other tricks in there to kind of get this through. The other papers look at more typical transformers that use softmax, and because you have a softmax, you're always gonna lose probability mass as you, as you increase your context and like, things break down. Um, and in some sense, the Turing completeness, you know, you can also think of it from this recurrence. So the issue is with transformers is, at least if you don't have the chain of thought, the chain of thought kind of changes things a little bit, but if you don't have the chain of thought and you think about the transformer, like the attention itself, if you, if you just look at the layer and you try to think of, of like the, 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 the expressivity of the attention layer, right? is not a universal approximator. So you can't show that by just stacking attention layers or just a single attention layer that you make you know, arbitrarily wide is never gonna get the, the, the universal approximator property because it's not sufficiently nonlinear, right? So it, 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 it's, like, it's like a bilinear form and you know, there's a class that you can describe it but it's not a, that of like, uh, it's, it's not nonlinear. So, Therefore, all the, like, the heavy lifting in a transformer when it comes to nonlinear processing is happening within the MLP block. Um, and you'll see this, so like people will tell you this, so if you have a transformer and you're trying to scaling up, and you ask yourself, where should I put these extra parameters to get more from it? It turns out that the place where you should throw the parameters is the MLPs. The attention layer, if you increase the embedding of the attention layer, it doesn't buy you that much because they're not doing the heavy lifting. The heavy lifting is actually happening in this MLP, and the MLP is the one that does the nonlinear processing. And in a typical transformer, the amount of non, you know, the nonlinear applications of like hidden layer, like MLP hidden layer, uh, is fixed. It, it, it's, it's a function of the depth. So if I increase the recurrence by some big number, or if I make it variable, so I can, you know, should be able to do any kind of uh, number of compositions, um, then I can easily break the transformer because it, it doesn't have this flexibility, right? It, it has a fixed number of uh, nonlinear steps that it does, and that cannot approximate an arbitrary number. Um, at test time, I can always come up with a number that's so much bigger than what the transformer can do. Um, there are some pathologies with the attention as well, uh, and there is this paper with Petar. Um, so Federico is the first author. He came out with the idea. It's pretty great. Um, 
But with softmax, what you realize, um, this is very frustrating. So this is, goes back to the early days when people started, you know, attention was there way before transformers. Um, and we always believe that the right thing to do is to have hard attention, but no one knows how to make it work. So the issue is softmax, and if you remember, there were Turing neural machines that Alex Graves and others did and never took off because they don't work. The issue there is when you have soft attention, you always have probability mass that leaks, right? You cannot have, it's, it's hard to not have information leak to the other things that you're not technically want to attend to. Um, and you can push that, so here in this, that's to a big extent, that's part of what's happening here, is if you start making the sequence longer and longer, because things are not perfect, perfectly orthogonal, you have this probability mass leaking, and at some point, like basically, things will look the same. And, 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 and the transformer will not be able to distinguish between these sequences. So the, we have these sequences of one with a variable number of ones and a zero at the end. And if you look at the embeddings, you'll see that at some point, if the sequences are long enough, they would lead to the same embedding because of this probability mass. And then at that point, the transformer can't tell things apart. So that's, that's one way to look at it. Another part of this is, so I guess, you know, graph neural network people like to talk about over-squashing. For me, this is vanishing gradient and so forth from recurrent neural networks. What the other thing you can do is you can look at the number of paths that take you from a token to sort of the place where you're making the prediction. And you can see that this number of, to uh, of paths uh, grows exponentially with the length of, so it's not, not all tokens have the same number of paths to go from where they are to the prediction, and that creates an imbalance that is really hard to deal with. So the attention weights are supposed to balance this out, but you can see that it's actually quite problematic, and if you play with it, what you notice is the usual behavior that maybe you guys have heard of, where if you have a really long context, you can very well attend to the beginning, you attend to the end relatively well, but it's hard to attend to the middle. And this comes from this balancing act that you need to do, and it turns out that the way the softmax and everything is set up makes that very hard. It's not that it's necessarily impossible to represent. You can get an impossibility result if you want to, if you introduce numeric precision and all this kind of stuff, and you can show, okay, if I make the sequence long enough and I only have this many bits to represent every quantity, at some point, you know, I can't represent the things I want to. If you just stay with pure math, it's not necessarily an impossibility result. I think you can always kind of resolve this, but it becomes a really hard balancing act to do. And in practice, empirically, transformers are not that good at doing it, right? So, so these are sort of just issues that you get with the architectures that you have, and then you can think of like, okay, I want to fix this, and this is exactly the kind of data that I have, and I want to think of how can I rearrange my computation such that this kind of balancing act becomes so easy, and, and the model can do it. Um, the other thing is um, there are other constraints and, and things that we need to think about. So one thing, ML is expensive, it's harmful, so I think the expensive thing usually takes precedence, but it's also harmful in terms of like how much compute it uses and sort of what impact that has on the environment. So if you have a system that works the same, has kind of the same issues, but it's 10x cheaper, that, that is important, that should be important. And that's another way to think about the architecture. So sure, maybe we can do everything with the data and we just scale things up, but if we could do it cheaper, you know, that, that, that's important, and that's sort of where the SSM bit is gonna come in. Um, there is also um, other things, like for example, you know, we, we had extreme heat and you know, people like to do weather prediction. Weather prediction is kind of like a weird thing, right? Because it's forecasting, it's online learning, it's not normal learning. Uh, you have all of these systems where you have to interact with the environment that keeps changing with, you know, in RL and so forth. Um, I mean, maybe people will say differently, but we really do not know how to train neural networks in an online fashion or in a continual learning fashion. I'm not going to talk about that, but almost anything that you do kind of breaks. So we really, transformer works and, and architectures works and we can just play with the data if we're in this static regime. If we're in an online regime, it's a complete different game. And, and um, architectures play a role there quite a bit. Uh, so there is a lot in sort of the architectures that we have that make gradient descent break when you train them online. So there's this idea of interference because of the way sharing and how the architecture looks. And you know, that's, that's a big problem that needs to be resolved. Oh, sorry, I have to skip the slide. Those are my, okay, so now I'm gonna jump into the safe space model. So this is supposed to be a case study. So we talked about all the reasons why we might still care about playing with the architecture. So there's all of these kind of you know, issues that we might not be able to resolve differently. 
Um, and I wanted to talk about a particular family of models that now emerged in the last, I guess, couple of years, and everyone is excited about it, and I just wanted to tell you what they are, how they work, are they any better, um, and what weaknesses they have. Um, and, and this is work that I've done with a bunch of folks at, at, at GDM. It started with Antonio, who was doing an internship, and then there was a lot of other people that got involved. And yeah, so the, the, in most of the things I present, there's many people that actually made that happen. Um, the slide is a bit old, but the hype is still there. So every other month I hear about a startup around this assembly and so forth. So there's definitely people are excited about that, this architecture. Um, and, and then there is a real question of does it really change things uh, fundamentally? And I know there's a lot of people out there, some say they do, some, some are really against this architecture and say actually it's just sort of smoke and, and it's nothing, nothing new. Um, and to explain what it does and how it works, I'm going to start with some fundamentals, right? So I'm going to try first to explain what a recurrent neural network is because I think um, that was mentioned, I think, in Chalar's talk and so forth, but I felt like there's a little bit more details that are useful for you to have. And then with that, we're going to present SSMs as a particular form of recurrent neural networks, and we're going to try to understand what changed since LSTMs or whatever, um, and, and, you know, why should it work now and why it didn't work four years ago. So a bit of historical context. So a lot of this is happening in language modeling, and it's nice to think, you know, it's nice to look back and see how things evolve. Um, plus, I, I, I find this, this course quite funny, so I stole them from Kuyung's show slides. Um, so in language modeling, um, just to have a bit of context, people really did not like, um, you know, uh, learning, um, um, statistical learning, so they thought it's a bad idea. So if you go back to the 50s, I think that's when the review was. Um, so, so I don't know if the pointer works, but oh, somewhat. So this, this thing in yellow here, so this is how reviews used to be done. So the review from the 50 that, that Cho somehow managed to get from some archive somewhere and, and take a photo of. It's a review of a paper that is proposing to use statistical learning to do translation, which is what we do nowadays. Um, and you guys can't read it, uh, but it basically says, this is a horrible idea, this is not science, no one should try to use compute to solve this kind of problem, and we shouldn't do it. And then you jump a few years in the future, and you have uh, Fred um, uh, Jeleniak, if I'm pronouncing his name correctly, who was sort of the lead of the IBM team that was doing this kind of stuff, and IBM in the 80s used to be the place to be, and he was saying, every time I fire a linguist, you know, the performance goes up. Um, and that sort of was his strategy, is just firing linguists from the IBM team. So there's been like a drastic shift uh, between these things, and, and I think it's interesting, and then you'll see this in, in sort of in architecture design as well. You can think of it as a shift, but I think there's actually a cycle, because I feel right now like linguistic elements starts again to play a role, because we got to a place where we get the system that are doing surprising things, and we don't know how to understand them. And, and I think it's a place where you now need people to actually understand language, to look at the output of the systems and try to make some kind of qualitative judgment of is this system doing something interesting? Because like statistic, statistical evaluation of, of LLMs is just, you know, it's not really working the way we, we necessarily want it to. So, so and, and with architectures, we see this as well. You know, we are, we, we current networks will see it as well. They weren't popular, they became popular, they're not popular, now they're popular again. And I think any architecture will go through these kind of cycles. And, and you know, it, it's, it's, nice, it's nice to see that. So that's where we started. So I think in the 80, 80, you know, 90, you know, with, with people like, uh, like IBM and other folks, you know, people started liking statistical learning. And then the question was, and on the neural side, the question was, how do you use neural network to do language? Um, and, and I think for me, for the RNN, the way I saw this problem, the way the problem was presented to me, the fundamental issue is, you know, you have two choices. One of it is to make this nth order Markov assumption, where you say, I have a fixed con context, and this is all I need to do the next prediction for the next word, and this is what we do nowadays. Um, and, and this, back in the day, was necessary. So in the 90s, this is how you do the things. The, there was precedent because you, um, you had n-grams, which were the popular scheme back then, and they kind of made the same thing. And you had to do this because the only architecture that we had working was feed-forward neural networks. And feed-forward neural networks, they need a fixed length input, right? So if you're going to use an MLP, you know, you need to do this kind of assumption. 
We had to do this for computational reason. We didn't know how to train neural neural networks properly, um, but it was always seen as a, as a problem. And for a long time, and that sort of was, I think, behind the success of LSTMs, was this intuition that at least for language, we need to get rid of this. The fixed window is, it's, is bad. That's not how language works. You need to have access to the entire history to know what to do. And people are trying to find ways to do that. And even back then in the 90s, we kind of knew what the solution was. So we had recurrent neural networks. We just didn't know how to make them work. So, you know, like even when I started my PhD, you know, when Joshua got me there, he was saying like, oh, you have to work on recurrent neural networks. I always get a guy to work on recurrent neural networks because, you know, they have to work at some point. They weren't working back then. You know, I, I spent three years not, not getting any, you know, not getting anything done because they weren't working. But, you know, there was this kind of mentality that they have to work. They're the only way to, to get rid of this assumption. So we need to put some people to, you know, hit their head against it. And um, I tried to borrow some of this stuff from Jürgen Schmidtuber's site about the history of Ukrainian your networks. You might have mixed feelings about that. I've, I've adapted things a little bit. But, you know, uh, anyway, I think it's useful to have some kind of grounding. So where did RNN start with? So according to Jürgen, it's in 20, 1925. I don't know if that's really true, but that's his first RNN. And really, like, I think the important big steps that happened was around 80s and 90s when Amari and others developed backprop through time, which is really just backprop, but just applied on the unfolded model. Um, and and Hava Siegelman's result, which I think had a huge impact on the field. So what happened is we had these architectures. Um, we kind of knew how to train them with BPTT. Uh, there were tons of other algorithms. I, I think people underestimate how many algorithms are there to train recurrent neural networks. Everyone just know about BPTT, but you had like weird functions used, green functions that I don't even know what they are, and there's like a whole family. There's a paper that has at least 10 different algorithms to train recurrent neural networks. If you go to the literature in the 90s, you know, if you want a fast paper, you just go there, you take any of that algorithm, you apply it to a new mo model and see what happens. But there were like tens and tens of algorithms. Over time, BPTT is the only one that survived. So we had some algorithms, and then we have Hava's result, which was pretty impressive. So what she managed to do is to prove this expressivity result. So she showed, this is the first paper that we have that showed that a nonlinear recurrent neural network is Turing complete. And this is a, a, a proof by construction. So what she did, she, she specified some weights. You, you, you put these weights there in the recurrent neural network, and now you can imitate any Turing machine that you want under some constraints, right? And the first proof, again, use some assumptions that maybe are unrealistic, like you have infinite precision and all that kind of stuff. Um, the interesting fact is, People still work on this, Hava still works on this, so she has a paper from 23 that refines the, 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 the theorem. Um, so it's, a, it's kind of like an active area of, 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 of research and it's kind of interesting. Um, but that kind of <clears throat> gave recurrent neural networks this special status, right? Because you think of any neural network that you have, any V4 neural network as a universal function approximator, so that's kind of the, the biggest you know, thing that it can do. Recurrent neural networks, because of this Turing completeness, they can approximate dynamical systems. And in mathematics, those are very different objects. And dynamical systems are way more powerful than, than functions, right? They can do things functions can't do because they have memory. Um, so, so that kind of you know, propelled recurrent neural networks at a special level. But then the biggest issue is this vanishing exploding gradient problems that we had. Um, and that seems to be kind of like the, 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 the Achilles heel of, 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 of these models and, and why they weren't popular until maybe like, I guess, 2014. So I know LSTMs were published in 97, but it took a really long time for people to realize that they do something interesting. So it was 2014 with, with Alex Graves' work that, that people actually start paying attention to LSTMs. To be fair, in the meantime, there were other small things that happened, like gradient clipping, that if you don't have, you can't get RNNs to train. So, so there were reasons it took so long for it to happen. Um, and then just to understand recurrent neural networks, um, I'm going to skip this slide to make it faster. So, so I think the easiest way to understand a recurrent neural network is to attach semantics. So the way you should think about it is a recurrent neural network is made of two functions. The first function, which is this plus operator here, what it does, it takes some history that you have. This is a vector. It takes some input, and it just composes those together. So it just compresses this new input into your history. So it takes some history, and you expand that history by adding a new element to the same fix. So this is 
the first step that you do in a recurring neural network, and then you have a decoder. So this is your output layer that takes the history and, and does a prediction. And that's how the systems works, right? So you have this history, this context, whatever you want to call it, it's fixed length. This will become your bottleneck in, in sort of how the model processes. And every time you see a new observation, you're compressing that within the history. And then every time you need to do anything, you decompress with a decoder and, 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 and do your prediction. Um, and I, I bring this, like I ended up having a paper because I've added this semantics to the RNN. Um, it turns out that, you know, when people are talking about deep RNNs, no one knew what that meant. Uh, and this is sort of what Alex did. And because you are sort of the guy who made LSTM works, this is what everyone does. So this is stacked RNNs where you just stack on RNN on top of the other. But if you think of this kind of semantic components, it's interesting to think about each of them and any of them can be made deep. So like in my paper, I made this argument that if you're trying to compress things, that's a hard operation to do. So you might want a universal approximator to do that, right? The, the, if you look at the mechanism that compresses a new observation in your state, that can't do that much. So, you know, and, and I create this like, I, it sounds funny nowadays, but you know, I create all of this language of how to make deep RNNs, right? And the different letters, different placements, something different, but you know, you can make this process of compressing the history to be done by an MLP or, you know, by some deeper neural network that's a bit more powerful with whatever structure that you have. And you can make the decoding step to be a bit more complicated, right? It, can't, it shouldn't be just a linear readout, but it should be, because if it's a linear readout, that puts a lot of pressure on how you compress the data, right? You, you need to compress it such that it's linearly decodable, which, which adds a lot of stress. So, so there's like all these funky ways in which you can make architectures deep, which I find funny because if you take a feed forward model, there's only one way to make it deep, right? It's kind of clear, you just add stuff. It just kind of shows you that RNNs are slightly different and they behave different. Oh, those are, uh, okay, so the, the, the gray circles are the, the, the typical layers, how a normal RNN would look. So this is just the standard RNN I showed before, and these white circles are the things I've inserted to make those uh, different sub-functions deeper. So, so in order to make the compressing function um, to be like an MLP, basically I add this nonlinear layer here. So it's the same nonlinear layer, but just to kind of contrast which are the new bits and which are the old stuff. And by the way, if you have questions, interrupt me throughout, right, so don't, don't. Um, okay. And, and what is the issue with these architectures? Is this exploding vanishing gradient? Um, and if you write the math, it looks really ugly. I don't know how to make it look nice, so I use colors. I don't know if that helps. Um, but basically what happens, what you have to think about it is, and, and you know, people don't do this uh, anymore, but you should go through the exercise of writing the, the gradients. It's actually quite insightful. Um, looking at gradients is maybe one of the more insightful things you can do with neural networks. But if you write a chain rule and you expand it, you get that it's a sum of stuff, and every term in that sum has this form. And the interesting bit of that form, like, you know, is that, that this is a product, right? So what happens, each, each term is multiplied by a product of the same Jacobian. So you can think of this as Jacobian as some power. I mean, it's, it's data dependent, so things are a bit more complicated. You know, Jacobians at each time step are different. That, that's sort of the issue of nonlinear non RNNs. But you can, you can say, well, they're roughly the same. It's just W recurrent transpose. Um, and then it, this is sort of the effect of multiply, raising a number to some power. Like, you know, if you think, let's, let's forget about matrices. Everything is a scalar. This is just sort of, oh, I have this. Um, k to the power t inside my every term. And now you just need to think of what happens when you raise a number to a power. And then this is the whole story of exploding vanishing gradient, right? If you have, if k is below one, as you raise it to a power, you have this exponential decay, it quickly goes to zero and information vanish. Um, if, 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 if k is larger than one, then things explode and, and nothing is stable, right? So this is, this is the, the whole, I mean, I, I'm sure you guys already knew it, but this is the whole story between vanishing and exploding gradient. Maybe the one thing that I notice people don't realize that often is that because you have this sum on the outside, when things vanish, you can't tell. So I don't know, people keep saying, like, why don't you look at the gradients? If they go to zero, you have a problem. It's not like that, right? So it's not that the gradient, the gradient will always have this norm when gradients vanish. You'll never be able to tell that you have an issue. The problem is if you write the chain rule, there are some terms in the sum that disappear and some terms that do not. So there's a term so that, that are looking a short term memory and the terms that are looking a long term memory, just those that look a long term memory vanish. The other ones stay, you know, those have k to a very small power. So they, they don't get affected. 
And you can't compute each term independently because that's extremely expensive. I mean, that's the whole trick of backprop through time is for you to never have to compute those terms because if you have to compute them, you, you just, you're not gonna be able to do anything. It's, it's way too expensive. So, so that's why vanishing gradients is such a hard problem is because you can't even tell whether it's happening or not because you can't see it in your gradients. You know it could happen in that chain rule if you expand it, but when you just try to look at numbers, you, you can't see it, right? So, so that's the sort of why maybe it's way worse than exploding gradients because exploding gradients, you can see it. You look at the gradient, the norm goes up, that's it, you know, you, know, you have an issue. Vanishing, you can't tell. Um, Okay, so there's all kinds of ways to think about this. I just copied this from, from my old paper, but, but basically the, there are multiple ways to think about the vanishing gradient problem. Back in the day, I, I don't think it's a thing anymore, but back in the day when we talked about Riconian networks, we always talk about dynamical systems and people like dynamical systems. So if you think about dynamical system, what does it mean for gradients to explode? It means that you're going through a bifurcation. So you know, if you have so a kind of rich dynamical system, so you have this, um, this issue is that you can have a small, basically, as the change in your parameters goes to zero, the, the change in your behavior kind of stays constant. So, you know, no matter how small of a change you make, the, the change in your output is big, therefore things explode. Um, and, and why is this important is because when you're crossing a bifurcation boundary in the dynamical systems, uh, local information becomes meaningless. So basically the point is when you're at this stage, gradients are not informative. They're not telling you how you're supposed to move because they don't know how you're supposed to move. Like, you know, the function is discontinuous at that point, so the gradient on this side doesn't know what's happening on the other side because there's no continuity. And that's sort of what this exploding gradient is about. It's like as you train this model, you hit these bifurcation boundaries and the gradient becomes uninformative and you're lost. Uh, another like more like traditional optimization thing is this sort of like you have this wall of curvature. So you know when you get here, you know gradients froze, froze you away and you try to avoid it. Okay. Um, and the vanishing gradients is kind of the same, yeah, the vanishing gradient is kind of the same thing, but it's the reverse when things go to zero and then you can't really tell where that is happening. Um, and, and, you know, like in the early days, as I tell you, told you, people liked dynamical system perspective and, you know, we're talking about fixed point attractors, complex theory, and, and all of this, like if you take all of this intuition, basically it tells you how do you know whether you're going to have issues with vanishing gradients, exploding gradients, it's all in the eigenvalues or in the spectral radius of your recurrent weights. This comes from an approximation and we know from dynamical systems or whatever that if the eigenvalue is smaller than one, you're going to have a point attractor at zero, everything is going to be stable, but information will vanish in the system. If not, things are going to explode. And, 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 you know, intuitions like this kind of created this whole community that somehow people in the U.S. and Canada never paid attention to, but in Europe it was big. So it's this Ecostate Networks. I used to be part of it. Um, and then Ilya kind of took a lot of intuitions from, I mean, he gave credit to them, but he took a lot of intuitions from what they do and, and published this paper, and then everyone started using sort of the insights that the Ecostate community uh, used to have, um, which is around how you're supposed to initialize the neural network and do all kinds of stuff. So actually a lot of stuff that we do is, is based on Ecostate networks. I still think they're a good model to think of the dynamics of neural networks. And, um, if you're thinking about this kind of vanishing gradients and exploding gradients, you know, you ha might have a question of what's the right thing to do, and it feels like, and, and there was works in this space, and somehow SSMs are kind of moving in this direction, was, well, you need to just stay, you know, have all your eigenvalues to be zero, and then there's no information vanishing, right? Um, and then there's a question of how to do this, so there are different approaches. So these two papers are trying to reparameterize your neural network such that HGD keeps you on the sphere for the recurrent weights. That can be a bit painful and it can be a bit mathematically complicated, but it can be done. Um, you can make this into a soft constraint. This is what I've done a long time ago. And you can say like, oh, just push your eigenvalues to be big and you know, you're gonna be good. So there's all kinds of ways, but somehow none of, the, none of this really worked. And then you know, when we're gonna go to the SSMs, we're gonna have exactly the same issue. It's a recurrent neural network, and then we're gonna try to understand why now we can control the systems and we couldn't before in a really nice way. Okay, yes? So, so that says if I, you know, if I have those terms, I pick any of those terms because it doesn't matter which one you pick. And if I multiply with another Jacobian, 
So I raise to the exponent to, it has that power k, and I make it k plus one. I want the ratio of the norms before and after to be one. So basically, multiplying with the Jacobian did not decrease the norm of my vector. So I have a vector that I'm projecting on this product of Jacobians, that, you know, these are matrices. So I want to say if I'm projecting on uh, W to the power K or I'm projecting on W to K plus one, I get the same norm. That's kind of how I froze it. it that's kind of the idea. It, it, should, it should control all the eigenvalues, really. So it should make the, all the eigenvalues of, of this Jacobians to be one. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the truth is, like, that never took off, right? No one is doing, I mean, I, I don't think anyone in this room ever even knew that that was proposed at some point. The issue is, it's like, it's like meta-learning. Now, if you want to learn, you need to backprop through the gradients, and you get all of this mass. It can be done, but it's expensive, and, you know, it's, I still think it's a cool idea. You know, I would like this to work, uh, but... I don't think anyone is using it. But fundamentally, it's a way to think of the problem. It's a way to resolve the problem. Um, the other thing I wanted to bring up, because I think this is, again, it's kind of interesting. So a lot of people nowadays you know, really like to look at the gradients. And as I said, gradients are great. Um, and usually, we think that if we have gradients um, that are sort of, um, so if I'm looking at the output and I'm computing the sensitivity to some input, um, and then sensitivity is not 0, then it means I, you know, I, I I, that, that thing is in my memory through the system, right? I can reason about it. I, you know, I have access to that particular token. That is not necessarily true. And the simplest example is always this one. So if I sum n numbers, it doesn't mean I can figure out which numbers I summed, right? If I'm looking at a sum, I can't tell what I summed. So just the fact that there is gradient, it doesn't mean that the values that, that you've seen are actually represented internally. The, op the opposite is also true. So if you have zero gradient, it doesn't mean that the system does not know that the token occurred. So like it, it's actually, you know, this whole point of like um, uh, using attractors as memory. You know, you have a, like a sigmoid recurring neural network and you make one of your units saturate if you see a bit. And then you just know if that unit is one or zero, you know if you saw it or not. But if you look at the gradients, the gradients are zero because the, the, the unit saturated. So I think, you know, because of LSEMs and whatnot in the community right now, everyone's just looking at gradients and that's sort of the test to know, like, you know, I have a, a system that's been pre-trained. I want to know, can this system attend this thing or can it talk about this thing? And I compute the gradient and if the gradient is non-zero, it means it can reason about that. If the gradient is zero, it means it cannot. This is not exactly true, uh, but, you know, that's where we are and that's what people tend to do. But it's worth knowing and it's worth thinking about this thing when you're trying to understand and explain how a system behaves. You know, gradients are, are you know, are just telling you this much. There's a lot that they're not telling you and you should be careful if you're into, like, explainability and stuff like that because they can be quite misleading. Um, okay, so I'm, okay, I need to maybe speed up a little bit. But moving forward, so what happened? So what changed everything? So we added, uh, so we moved to LSTM world and then GRU. So um, what happened is we added these gates that are controlling, um, are, are controlling sort of how much information can go into the recurrence or not. You know? so, so the way this tends to be explained, I don't think this is how it works, but the way I think all, everyone explains LSTMs is you have this black box and you have these doors and they can be open and closed. So you open the door, you let some information in, you open the output door, some information goes out and, and so forth, right? And that's sort of how it works. And you, know, you get figures like this, you know, it's like a circuit and you have this thing that you turn on and off. Um, in practice, and, and that's sort of where SSMs come as well, and, and I think this was known, like people who did these papers, they were talking about this all the time. In practice, these gates are never closed or open, and the right thing, the right, in my mind, the right way to think about them is they're just kind of filtering the signal. So actually, I think signal processing kind of um, tools are very useful to think about recurrent neural networks. And actually how you think about the gating mechanism is they, they just basically act as a low pass filter that is filtering your signal. And, and you know, because of that, you focus on the low frequency content that has a much longer temporal extent. So you can reason about some aspects of your past because you're now capturing this low frequency content and you're kind of ignoring the high frequency content. So in practice, when you start studying these gates, 
you'll see that they have this kind of weird behaviors. There's some other weird behaviors that, I mean, I just mentioned it because I talked to a few of you guys about this. The other weird thing about the gating mechanism, so all these gates are supposed to solve the vanishing gradient problem and everyone says it's solved. Another issue with them is, well, um, in some, okay, let me express it in terms of attention. In some sense, gradients keep flowing through the value. If you think the gate as being your attention weight that is kind of uh, multiplied with the value, so it's, it's uh, uh, I guess, well, what would be the formula here? So it's like they go through this uh, HT minus one, but there's no gradient flowing in the gates. Actually, the sigma is that you use to do the gating makes the gates themselves become rigid. And what that means is if I learn how to attend at some point in time, and I need to change how I'm attending, like what I'm letting in and what not, it turns out that that's really hard to do because you don't, the model is not plastic. You don't have gradients flowing and you can't change gates. So the same happens with the softmax. You know, softmax saturates, there's no gradient flowing. If I, you know, learn to attend to the first three tokens and suddenly all the information is somewhere else, the model cannot switch its attention mechanism, cannot unlearn to look there and look the other place because there's no, gradients flowing through the attention ways themselves. So, so there's still vanishing gradients in all of these systems, um, but you know, because you can always change your value function and you can always change the loss, it doesn't look like the system is stuck. You know, it doesn't look like you don't make any progress, the gradients are not zero, but they're not making into the right direction. Okay, so finally we're getting to SSM. So just a summary. So I talked a lot about recurrent neural networks and just sort of a bit of a positive and negative. And then um, when we moved to SSMs, they were basically looking at a list like this and they were trying to fix some of the negatives and we're gonna talk of how they did that. So the positives, it is a very natural and compact choice. So I didn't say this explicitly, but in the 80s when people came up with them, they were based on the brain. The brain is a recurrent neural network, it's the most natural choice, it's very compact, it can deal with the sequence in a very natural way. So people really like that about it. They have fast inference, I haven't talked about this, but if you look at how it works, you know, you have this history, it's a fixed thing, and every time you need to do something, you just decode from it. So, you know, it, it doesn't matter the sequence length, you're always creating this history, and the history is bounded, so everything, you know, inference is fast. And they have this Turing completeness, which got people extremely excited about. So they're you know, the most expressive class of function that we can have. So you know, that, 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 that should count for something. The negatives is exploding vanishing gradients. So training is hard. Training is expensive. Oh, yeah, I said scalability. So training is expensive. So the issue is if you want to train this thing, you need to go forward in time. And then to compute the gradients, you have to go backwards in time. So that's how back to time works. You can't parallelize things, right? So it's, it's very expensive. You'd get like 10x more expensive than a transformer or whatnot easily. You know, it, it, they're just not scalable. And then another issue is the, there is this expressivity bottleneck, right? So what happens is we're building this history that you has to encode everything. And you have to ask yourself, what happens where there's no more room to encode stuff, right? If I have an infinite sequence, I can't write that into a fixed length vector. So something should happen. So there is this compression process that will make, you know, you need to make a choice of what you throw away. And the issue with recurrent neural networks is you make these decisions before you know what you're gonna use that history for. So you need to have like an inductive bias that you say I'm gonna throw something out and I need to decide what I'm gonna throw out before I look at my sequence and know what the sequence is about. And this can create problems, right? So you have this, this process of, of, of compression. This can be a plus as well, and I, I would really like for someone to be able to prove this. But you know, in machine learning, compression equals generalization equals good. So the fact that the RNNs are forced to compress, they should be good for something, right? So it means that like you can reason not just about your memory, but a generalized form of your memory, because you know, they get compressed together, so you can confuse between things, but that can easily be a good thing. So, you know, compression is not necessarily a bad thing. In ML, like actually compression is the key to get good generalization, um, but you know, it can also be bad if you're just trying to do re, um, retrieval, and you're just like, oh, what was the number of John, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, that's not gonna, gonna work. But if you need to generalize over your memories, then this is gonna help. The other thing that I'm gonna mention here is optimization, and it goes back to the first slide. So you have this um, Turing complete that people are super excited about. There is no paper saying what I'm saying now, but I'm 95% sure it can be proved. 
The, the neural networks you can reach by backprop through time with normal learning, if you think of that set, the reachable neural networks, that is not Turing complete. It's, I think it's very, it, it is possible to set up like a distillation process where you have a teacher and a student of the same size, both recurrent neural networks, and show that the, that distillation process fails. And you cannot take this teacher and move it into the student. And that is because of this sort of bifurcation and instability of the system. So you can always pick a teacher somewhere very far away in a regime where nothing you know, behaves properly. And then local search by gradients will not tell you how to move in that space. So yeah, so there is, you know, like we, people really like this Turing completeness, but it might mean nothing because potentially we never had Turing complete architectures because we don't know how to learn during complete behavior. Okay, state space models, I hope you're still with me. Um, so now we're getting maybe to the bit that you guys were actually interested in. Um, so there, this is a new family of RNNs. There's lots of papers. Every other week there's a new paper. And on pay, you know, they're trying to fix two things. They're trying to make the system tr stable in training and they're trying to make it scalable. That, that is the goal of the system. Oh, 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 of this family of architectures. Um, and this is sort of just like a, a quick look. So this is up to 2023. By now there's a lot more papers, but you know, like you can see how many papers appeared. Granted, a lot of them are coming from Stanford where they made up this model. You know, they're very productive and they like to publish a lot. But there's a lot of people interested in the architecture. And, and at a quick look, the architecture is, uh, this is the SSM layer, this is the recurrent neural network. And it is embedded into this transformer block that is repeated, and then they run this on a bunch of things, and it works better than anything else. Um, um, and we're going to try to understand this, and um, I'm just mentioning the block because it's actually quite important. Okay, so, uh, I, so, so okay, it, it's important, and maybe just to add, no paper usually looks at the block that much. Everyone talks about the SSM layer, which actually is not as important as you think, but the whole block structure around it makes it to work. So, so it's kind of like a misguided thing to just look at the SSM layer and say, oh, I changed this thing in my linear recurrence and that made it work, is there is a lot of interaction with the block around it. And without the block, the, the layer itself doesn't do much. Okay. So where did this come from, uh, you know, how were they introduced? So this is this idea of starting from continuous, um, um, so you're in a continuous domain uh, and you have this uh, continuous system, you know, written as a differential equation and you're discretizing it and you're, you know, you're doing some like signal processing stuff on it and you get your SSM, kind of that's the idea. So SSMs are meant to be continuous time and when we use them in practice, we just discretize them. They have this deterministic initialization um, that they use and they're meant to be fast. So I'm just gonna, you know, so I think they were called state space models because in control theory, this is a thing. You know, I'm not a control theory person, so I'm not the right person to, to talk about sort of what they mean in control theory, but you know, they've been around since the 60s. And, and, and Albert, when he did this work, he took a lot of inspiration from there. So he decided to call them SSMs. Personally, I think they should have been called RNNs because I think people think that they're just quite different and they're not. Um, and the idea is you take sort of this ODE formulation of a linear continuous system and then you do some discretization and as soon as you do a discretization, you get a formula that looks like a recurrent neural network with the only exception that the weights that you have have a specific form that comes from your discretization process and if, depending on what kind of discretizations you pick, you get a different architecture, right? You do uh, but, but, but you take the bilinear uh, method and you get like the S4, you can do whatever you want to do, like an Euler step, you can do, I mean, you know, you guys probably know better than me, but there's many ways you can discretize the system, some are better than others, and, and they give you different architectures. Um, and, and then these architectures have this very complicated looking structured weights, right, where you need to take an inverse, you need to do all kinds of like weird stuff. Um, the other uh, thing that Albert did is that he said, well, I'm not going to treat this as a normal neural network, but I'm going to use this uh, HIPPO theory, and there's a paper, so Albert likes math. This is paper full of math where he tries to derive this HIPPO matrix initialization from first principles, where you're trying to find out 
how to um, initialize the system such that the discretization best capture what's going to come next. So there is the sign of compression argument. So the po whole point is that this matrix is supposed to encode the whole sequence so far. You go to sort of like polynomial approximations of random functions and you work that through and you know some heavy math. And you end up with a, with a weight matrix that looks like this. And for anyone who does deep learning, this looks horrible, right? So it's a deterministic matrix. You have like powers of stuff. And, you know, it just doesn't look natural. And, 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 but this is how this thing works, right? You get this A matrix that has this very specific form, and this is how you initialize the model. Um, and then you can view this as a recurrent neural network, as I said before. Um, and then you can do all kinds of tricks to make it fast. Um, um, uh, but m in many scenarios, you end up with complex numbers that you have to deal with and all of these things. Um, and you can parallelize computations because the system is linear. Um, so there's this associative scan. I'm going to talk more about it. But the whole point is if you have a linear recurrence, it turns out that you can split that, that sequence into small chunks. And uh, so this is known from the 90s, maybe before. And you can create this associative operator, or the idea is as long as you have, so there's this theory that says as long as you have an associative operator of how to do your recurrence, then you can always split run on subsequences and then compose the outcome and get the right thing out. And for a linear recurrence, it turns out that the operator looks something like this. So if you change your recurrence to compute this, I, I mean, you don't need to know it because nowadays there is a PyTorch that associative scan that does everything, but you know, there is, that, that's the fundamental idea. So the fundamental idea is to notice that because of linearity, you have this associativity in how you do your multiplications. Therefore, you can rearrange your computations and, and that helps you to parallelize it. So you can parallelize it and if you have a sequence, you know, you split it into two, you compute some partial results on each of them and then there is a mechanism to kind of compose this to get the right answer. And this is sort of maybe if you look at the papers, this is sold as being the main advantage of SSMs is this associative scan, is this idea that now with these models, we can fully parallelize them as well as transformers. There's no more sequentiality to it. You don't have to go all the way forward and backwards. I don't think it's that important, and we're going to see why, hopefully in a few slides, if I, if I move a bit faster. The second way of viewing this is as a convolution. So you can try to write down what is the output of, of, you know, for step one, for step two, for step three, and you get that for step k, you know, you have this sum where you multiply your input with these values. So you can pull this out and build a kernel that is super wide and you write it as a convolution. That's kind of roughly the idea. Because it's linear, now you can you know, write all of these things and you, you realize that, well, you have you multiply with like different terms that can be pre-computed and they can form a convolutional kernel and then you can treat this as a convolution. In practice, you get some algorithm like this that I'm not gonna go into it, but it looks extremely ugly, right? So that kernel is kind of big and whatnot, so you do all kinds of approximations. So th I'm just like, you know, like my point is I'm just trying to explain why, you know, the first time I saw these things I was quite a bit confused because all the initial papers on SSMs are quite math heavy. They start with some in intuitive steps, but then you quickly get into these very complicated algorithms that take you into the Fourier domain and you do something there and then go back and then you do some other stuff and, you know, by the end of it, you're not sure what you're doing anymore except just multiplying some, you know, doing some computations. And, and that's not a good place to be, right? So, you know, as a, as a, as a, at least from my point of view, you know, if you like sort of machine learning, I think it's always important to have an intuition of what you're doing. If you're in a place where you just have this black box that you're throwing at stuff and it gives you a number, you're not in a good place, right? So you need to understand why am I multiplying these things? What is this Fourier, uh, you know, wh why am I going to Fourier domain? What does that mean? Why am I tr truncating things there? What am I losing? So, and, and if you look at the paper, I mean, if you, if you are like a signal processing guy or, you know, you work to if like Fourier transform all your life, probably you look at this and you know exactly what it does. Most of us probably looks at this and they don't understand a thing out of it. Um, and the whole point that we tried to do afterwards was to say like, do we need any of this? You know, can we explain this in a way that we don't need any of this crazy stuff? So this is sort of my, my slide. So this is where I entered the SSM kind of literature. We looked at all of this stuff, results were good, but we're like, what's going on? I, I don't understand any of this. Can we like take a step back and understand what's going on? 
And we're lucky enough to have um, Antonio coming to, to DMIME back then to do an internship, and we basically told him, like, okay, you figure out what all of this means and tell us. Um, and that was his sort of experience. <laughs> uh, I hope he liked it, I don't know. Um, okay, so, so we, Antonio, we're like, okay, we need to understand what's going on. This kind of looks like an RNN, but it has a lot of weird stuff in it. What happens if we just throw away all that stuff and just put an RNN, right? We know what an RNN is. Yeah, yeah, at least we think we know. Let's plug it in, does it work? Um, and then we did that and it didn't work and you'll see why and then we started taking steps towards the SSM and like figuring out like why doesn't it work, like what do we need to add to get there for it to work? Um, okay, I can, well no, actually I'm not gonna tell you the highlights. I'm gonna tell you the highlights at the end because I, I need to skip some slides. So the first thing you do, uh, the, first, the main thing that you see is well, all of these SSMs, the, the recurrence is linear, right? Uh, so we, we ran the nonlinear one, it wasn't working, so like, okay, let's make it linear, see how important that is. So the first step is, this is the typical formula for an RNN, so this is like the, the old school 90s RNNs, you know, no LSTM, no gating, no nothing, just a typical RNN. With the 10 age, we tried the ReLU as well, just to see, you know, maybe something has changed in the meanwhile. Didn't work. So like, okay, let's make it linear, you know, like just throw everything out, let's, let's do the SSM stuff. And you do it linear, and it works way better. You know, you start getting results close to the SSM. And then at that point, you're asking yourself, like, what's going on? And, you know, you have to think, it's like, you know, RNNs have been a thing. There were people working on them for a long time. And why did no one try to make them linear? And there's a very good reason. Like, it's the same as for a D model. So take the nonlinearities, it's not expressive, right? It's a linear function. So we're like, okay, it's linear. Why does this work? And, and if you look at the SSM literature, of course, they had to ask the same question. And if you look in the whole that math, you always, you know, you see that they actually go through everything. They try to justify this using the Kubman operator that I'm not going to go in for those who know. But the Kubman operator basically says that any linear dynamical system is, if, is if, it's, if it's infinitely wide, then it can approximate any nonlinear one. And that's roughly why this should work. But we were really unconvinced because our own like experimentation in this kind of space showed us that if you are relying on the Kubman operator kind of theory, what happens is you really need to make it extremely large, wide, wide to, to have anything out of it. And this did not turn out to be the case here. So these linear NMs were relatively not wide, right? You know, they were like standard things, like a hundred hidden unit or less, and they were working okay. So it didn't felt like this Kubman operator was answering things. Um, I don't think we know what's going on. You know, this is a very open question. We did do some follow-up. So this is my current understanding, and it's also thanks to Antonio. But my, my current understanding is what's happening, there is a separation of concerns. And, and that, 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 that's happening because we're, sorry, I'm not talking the mic. That's happening because we're using this transformer block. And that's why I say it's very important. So if you don't have the transformer block, you can only rely on the Kubman operator kind of theory to do anything or to be able to capture any kind of expressivity. But once you have the block, what turns out is that the RNN is not trying to solve the task anymore. The only thing it's trying to do is to compress the sequence, and that's all it needs to do. And then the MLP on top that's applied pointwise is doing all the nonlinear processing that you need to do. And, and we know that to compress a sequence is not as hard as to apply some like random nonlinear, you know, recurrent transformation. And then in practice we did some experiments and if you look at the states of the SSM and you try to decode linearly things, you really see that it's a very good compressor, right? It does a really good job and you see that the, the, the system deteriorates when the, when the SSM is not able to compress and when it's able to compress, that's when you get really good values. And, you know, as far as I can tell at this point in time, this feels to me the most natural justification and it seems to kind of work. Again, it kind of relies on this mechanism that I did for INN as well, where we basically just ended up assigning semantics and we said, oh, this is compressing, this is, I mean, we had this intuition, we assigned the semantics, and then, you know, we did ablations and analysis to see if they hold or not. But just in general, when you have a model, you know, you, you, know, you should be aware the semantics never work out, but it's a good tool to say, okay, this, this bit is supposed to do X, this is supposed to do Y, and if things don't work out, like, let me test, is this doing X, is that doing Y, is there a reason this, this is not happening? So this was kind of the approach we've done here, and this is sort of what we got in terms of expressivity, but going back to this whole story about Turing completeness and Hava Siegelman, 
you see immediately when you do this is that the linear INN plus MLP form can only exhibit uh, fading memory. So you can easily see that any signal that you feed into a system, there is a fixed amount of time after which it has to disappear. And that means it's not Turing complete. Because I can easily come up with, a problem, with, the, with an algorithm that says store a bit of information for an arbitrary amount of time and the system can do it, right? The system can only hold it for T steps. After that, it disappears whatever input you give it. But a, but a Turing machine can store it for as long as you want it, right? It just stays busy. So, so this is important, and it's important like when you talk to, to, to neuroscientists and so forth, because you know, that's sort of they're gonna be the main beef with this kind of architecture, is because they think you know, the kind of memory we have is not of this form. And there's a really interesting question of like, what can you do with fading memory? <laughs> And what are tasks that you can't do unless you have sort of stable memory that you can store information for as long as you need? Um, but that's a different story for a different time. But I, you know, it, it, I, I think you know, that there, there is, you know, fundamentally we have sacrificed something. It just so turns out that in language modeling it doesn't matter. And in vision and in some other places it doesn't matter. But we have sacrificed something. These systems are not equivalent. A non-traditional non-linear NN can do stuff this model can never do, right? Um, okay, but what did we gain? So we sacrificed something, maybe something important. What did we gain? So what we gain is A, we can now diagonalize the system. So, you know, if you like linear algebra, you can do an SVD decomposition, push those matrices up and down, and you get a diagonal. That's very useful because it makes things cheap. So now you just need to do a vector vector element wise multiplication. The, the price you have to pay is that it has complex numbers, and that's where complex numbers are coming from. Um, and, and it's kind of funny because now no one is using complex numbers and it's a question of why, can we, why do we not use complex numbers? What does it mean? And you can go back to this and you can try to reason what does it mean not to have complex numbers? What assumption are you making on that recurrent weight? And you know, it's, it's that it's um, symmetrical. And then you have the parallelization that I already talked about. So these are the main gains. You can parallelize um, and you can make it cheaper by diagonalize it. Um, and you can see this, right? So it's, it's way faster. It's 10 times faster, whatever. And it, it, it's on the same level of, 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 of uh, it's as fast as a transformer. I mean, that's not the right, comp I don't have the comparison there. There is another subtle thing that you gain, which I think is way, way more important, but like the papers don't tend to talk as much about it, which is if we go back to the analysis that we did to talk about vanishing exploding gradients, the key point there was we have this product of Jacobians, but the problem is any of those Jacobians were input dependent because the nonlinear function, if you try to write down what the Jacobian is, it always depended on the input. Now, if I write the Jacobian, if I do the same chain rule for this linear system, that product is not input dependent. That, that product, it's really just W, the recurrent weights raised to the power K. So that means that, you know, you don't have to approximate you don't have to approximate, you know, how much is going to explode, how much, you know, you don't have to bound it from above, from below, whatnot. You know exactly what's going to happen to the system, and you can control it, right? You have those eigenvalues of the recurrent weights will tell you exactly how quickly the information fades, you know, whether you're in trouble, whether you're not in trouble. Um, and, and, you know, it goes back to this dynamical system view. Basically, what you have is you, you have the unit disk, because these are complex numbers, you know, eigenvalues. You can, you can think about just the magnitude, but basically, if they're inside the unit disk, everything is stable. If you're outside, things are not stable. If you're in the circle, you know, nothing fades. If you're inside, it fades exponentially fast with the magnitude of that thing. And, and what we gain is we can parameterize the model such that it's always stable. And it's easy, right? It's not like weird math or anything. It's like basically you just have to say, because you diagonalize the system, so you have the eigenvalues. You don't need to do any decomposition, any projection. You have the eigenvalues, they're the parameters you're learning, and you just have to say their magnitude has to be one. And you, know, you can do it any way you want. This is how we do, d did it with the exponential, and there is a little graph there that you can't really see it, but that graph is showing you that if you take the exponential of that thing, just because the real part is negative, that thing is always gonna have magnitude below one because that's how exponentials work. You can parameterize it any way you want, but the point is it's easy to parameterize for that to be below one, and that's sort of what everyone does, right? Um, that's the first step. So you get this extreme controllability. The other thing is now you can talk about how quickly information vanish, and that's again, that's very easy. Anyone working with these kind of systems will easily tell you, but the point is the information vanish exponentially, 
where the speed is sort of based on the eigenvalue magnitude. So, and, and you know, you can, you, can, you can compute these curves and you can see, you know, how long does it take? And, you know, you usually kind of, I mean, usually build intuitions like this, right? So, um, like, if you have, I don't know, 0.99, I think in 100 steps, any, any information that you gave it, it will vanish. Um, and, and this will tell you how to initialize the model, right? You can look at the signal and say, well, for this signal, I mean, I have, I need to keep information for like a thousand steps. How quickly, how long does it take, you know, for this? So you, you know, you do, you, there's, a, there's an equation, there's a, you know, you take sort of some, some stuff and, and you figure out that it's like, I don't know, 0 0.9999, something like that. And you can now define the range, right? And then the typical initialization that we do, so none of that HIPPO thing is we just say, I, I'm going to initialize eigenvalue in, in the circle. In, in a ring that is basically bounded by how long I need to keep the information in. And I can easily kind of estimate this by just looking at the data or whatever, and then I can quickly find those ranges and then uniformly sampling there. Um, yeah. Right, so it turns out that if you're on the circle, it doesn't work as well. It's not that well, I, we don't fully understand why, but I mean, I can make arguments that we've made. So some of the arguments is that uh, there is some noise in the signal, and you want to have some direction where information vanishes. So you do want to have directions where you can throw noise in for it to disappear. Um, the other thing is, I just think it has something to do with learning dynamics. That's sort of my actually my bigger gaze. So like, even though um, even though like information stays fixed, um, I think because you keep adding the input, you know, the norm of things can still grow. So that creates a problem. So typically, what you end up doing is you end up scaling things such that the activation stays roughly of the same magnitude. But then if you're on the circle, you don't know how to scale the input. Like, I mean, you'd basically, the, in theory, you'd say, oh, it has to go to zero, but that means that you're not seeing anything. So, so it just becomes a bit more problem. If you know your input is sparse, then it's, everything is fine. If your input is dense, it doesn't have a lot of zeros, you can run into troubles because you keep adding mass to your activations and they can kind of explode over time and it's not clear how to deal with. But I mean, in some sense, I think there's some, even some theory that, or some, some I mean, you know, you, you, like if you're on the circle, you can even rewrite this as being some kind of Fourier transform. So, you know, there, there are reasons to be on the circle. There's good ideas to be on the circle, but it just doesn't, in practice, doesn't work that well. Um, the other thing that seems to be important is the phase of this complex number. So I'm not going to insist on this because in a few slides it will turn out that we're not going to use complex numbers anymore. But the phase is basically telling you how quickly things mix. And if they mix too fast, it's not useful. So just to give you the high level intuition, the high level intuition is the, the rotation in the complex plane is encoding position. So you feed in some information and that thing keeps rotating in the plane. And by how much it rotates, that tells you how long ago have you added that information in the system. And you want to rotate slowly so that you can encode sort of position over long sequences. And that's why you want to control the phase to be small. But for some reason, people run without complex numbers because they're hard to implement on the device and it works as well. Um, we don't know how the position encoding happens. It still happens and it works and, 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 and people are happy with it. Um, the other, okay, so I had six steps, I never said this, but in the background, these were the six changes we had to do to get the system to work as well as an SSM. The fifth step, uh, which is not mandatory, but you can see how it can help, is you realize that, um, you know, a decay of 0.999 compared to 0.99, it's, it's a big thing, you know, adding that extra nine, it's, it makes a big difference. While if you compare 0.2 and 0.5, the decay is almost the same because it's an exponential, so they decay differently. So you basically want to have a lot of resolution close to one because really small changes changes a lot how quickly information decays. While if you're close to zero, small changes doesn't change that much how things decay. So therefore, you want to change the geometry of your parameter so that SGD can take very small steps when you're close to one, and it can take big steps when you're close to zero. Um, I mean, you can fix this in other ways, but the way we fix this is by changing the geometry. So basically, we apply the double exponential, and now if you look at the gradients, you'll see that if your parameter is close to one, the gradients become very small. 
if your parameters are close to zero, your gradients are large. So, so you know, it's just sort of like, because of the exponential, like now the gradients as well have this behavior. So that means that when I'm getting close to one, I'm gonna start taking smaller and smaller steps, and I can actually properly explore that region. That's very important. And this is a trick that a lot of the SSM people, uh, literature does. So, and that's kind of the intuition. It's just because it matters to have resolution there. Um, and the last thing is what, what I was uh, mentioning to Alfredo as well, there is this issue that we've been thinking of this as a dynamical system that doesn't have any inputs, but we have a system that has inputs. Um, and what we really want is the activations that do not blow up over time. So therefore, we need to think about normalizing, and we need to normalize the magnitude of the input by looking at the magnitude of the eigenvalues, because that tells us how much we keep so that we know how much we can still add. Um, and here, like to do this, you basically need to make assumptions. You can make whatever assumptions you want and you get different formulas. So this work, uh, we made the assumption that's obviously incorrect, that the input is coming from a Gaussian. And if you push that through, you, real, you get out this uh, uglier form of the gamma being one minus squared. That's just because of the assumption. If you make the assumption that the input distribution is differently, you'll get a different normalization. Um, and we see, just to give you an idea why these things is not perfect, we see this in practice. So if we train SSMs, and then we expand the context, we expand the sequences that, they, that we run them by orders of magnitude, we see that the activations start exploding because the assumptions we made were wrong, right? Because the input is not from a Gaussian. So you'll always run into trouble, but this is a good enough kind of approximation and it works decently well at scale. Okay, so these were the main things. Um, why do we not need complex numbers and what are the complex numbers useful for? So as I said, complex numbers, position encoding. My sloppy math tells me that if I make the model bigger, so the whole thing is when do you get complex numbers when the matrix is not uh, symmetric, right? If I, from math, if I'm doing SVD, if I have real eigenvalues, it means it's symmetric. So my, my sloppy math says if I have a system A, I can construct another system that's doubled in size, that has this form AA transpose, and now this system is symmetric but there is a way for the system to compute exactly the same thing as the smaller one. So probably the reason complex numbers don't matter is because we're in this weird regime where we always scale things up, and we scale them up enough that the complex numbers are not helping you anymore. That you needed them when you were, you know, because you can, you can construct this thing. This is the hypothesis, but we don't know, you know. And if you talk to any SSM folks, they will tell you, depending on the domain, you know, if you're not running language, try complex numbers, they might work, we don't know exactly what's going on. But intuitively, I think it has something to do with scale. Like if you're at a sufficient scale, I believe complex numbers are not gonna buy you much. If you have a small model, complex numbers should buy you uh, something. Uh, okay, so there are some things that we're missing. I don't know how much time I have left, but I'm gonna quickly go through them because I think they're interesting. Um, so how we wanted to do this in language, how did we start? Well, we did kind of similar to what other folks did before us. So we, we started from the transformer backbone and what we did is, you know, like, again, you assign semantics, so in the transformer you have these two sub-blocks, the MLP one and the attention one. We call the attention one as a temporal mixing because the only thing that it does, it mixes across the time dimension and the MLP mixes across the feature dimension, right? So we're thinking, well, a transformer it just does these steps, one mixing over time, mixing over feature, mixing over time, mixing over feature, and you have many options of how to mix over time. You can use the SSM, the recurrence, or you can use the attention, and that's sort of how we're gonna do this. Um, and the other thing that we've learned the hard way when we started this is, if you wanna do this for like large scale LLMs, whatever that is, the first thing you have to do, you have to start by thinking of how you're gonna shard this. If you build an architecture without thinking of how you're gonna distribute this over many devices, you'll never be able to distribute it. So you need from the beginning to say, I'm gonna, you know, this is how I'm sharding the architecture, and then build the architecture with that in mind. So we decided to go with the standard, you know, sharding strategy that the Megaton paper introduced, which is basically this, so basically, all you need to know about it is that it requires to have an even number of linears one of the other. If you don't have an even number, you can't shard it anymore. So that's kind of the constraint. So when you start doing your linear projections, that has to be, you, you have to be able to split it into chunks of like uh, even number of, uh, um, and any other operation needs to be blockwise or, or sparse, you know, for this to work. So, you know, we, we took the block from transformer and, you know, we, we said like, if you look here, like the green ones are the linear operations, so we have two of them on any branch, so we're good, we can shard, and then anything that's inside, it's, it's um, diagonal. 
So, so that's fine. It's LMWise operation, so that can be sharded, right? So any dense operations are in, in even. Uh, maybe it's worth, and yeah, I wanted to say a lot more about this. So you have this multiplication. I mean, people kind of, like, I don't know, like people are rediscovering stuff. So if you go back, like Jeff Hinton had papers talking about this. So it used to be we had the three-way RBMs, and you know, there was this, uh, so it was a, a big thing, the, the multiplication interaction. So this is an inductive bias, and I guess in Jeff's words, you know, addition is or, and you need multiplication to do and, because, you know, otherwise you can't do interesting things. Um, so we had some papers looking at it. So, so there are multiple reasons why you have the multiplication. One, it turns out that if you try to train to estimate functions that are non-smooth, the multiplication helps you quite a bit to have. So if you try to approximate the function that has the form if something do this, else do this other thing, you need that, that multiplication to kind of get the non-smoothness. And it's kind of connected to all this Boolean logic and so forth arguments from the, from the 90s and 80s. And there were like a bunch of papers. So, yeah, the, the, the first one I found was Hinton's uh, mapping units from 85, but there were like a lot of papers back then that argued this is important. There's some more different kind of angle that like uh, comes from like the schmidt group from, from Jürgen and others, where they have this thing they call fast weight programmers, um, which is, anyway, it just turns out that if you want to connect an SSM to a linear attention layer, you need the multiplication because the multiplication allows you to rearrange computations to show that these are exactly the same thing. So, so there is this work from uh, Joao Sacramento, there is some work from like the Schmutuber group that are talking about this uh, linear attention, fast weight programmers, and when they try to show that these things are the same, it turns out that you need this gating, it's quite important. The other thing that is kind of funny is it turns out this multiplication is the output gate. So SSM people say they don't have output gate, but if you, you look at the block, this multiplication turns out into an output gate. So it's the same as the LSTM output gate, but you've just put it outside of the layer. Um, there is this comp D, no one knows why it's there. It works really well, so you never want to take it out. So there's some arguments that it helps you to represent short-term memory much better because the SSM is smoothing things too much. We don't know if that's true. Another way to think of it, like this, uh, SSMs will tend to be gated, so, and the gate is just a function of the input. So this conf gives that gate a bit of context. So now the gate is a function of the last four uh, tokens you've seen, and that could be quite important. And, and this can be anything. So in all of this work, I'm going to talk about LRU, but in our experience, you know, you put whatever you like and kind of get the same stuff out of it. Um, so there is, uh, okay, so what is this uh, linear recurrence? Sorry, I'm repeating myself, but you know, is this, this uh, linear recurrence, and because it's linear, you can parallelize it quite well. Um, with the only downside, so you know, we, we take the linear recurrence, we diagonalize it, we have to use complex algebra, but uh, we reduce the, the number of flops that we have to do, and it's very important when we run things at scale. Um, when we run this and we try to compare the models like an S4D with LCM, we saw that we were, it wasn't working so well. And it turns out that if you add gates, it works quite well. And now this is the default, like if you look at any Mamba, they have these gates. In Mamba, they motivate it as a mechanism to filter the input. I'm not sure to what extent that holds, but it's very empirically shown by many folks that the gates help you. So, you know, like, we maybe don't understand why, but they're very important. This is the gates we tend to use. It looks very ugly. Um, basically, all I want to say about gates is that, like, they all kind of tend to look to be the same, right? So I can explain a bit in, in after the talk, I can explain a bit more how our gating mechanism works, but you can trace all of this gating mechanism to LSTMs or GRU and they're all kind of doing the same thing. We have a quirkiness in ours, but I think that's just sort of an artifact of how the model has been developed and I'm not sure it matters. I think you can revert to exactly GRU gating and it'll probably work the same. So it's, and, and the, you know, it's, so, so it's just like it's, kind of just gating, and then you put all of this together and you, you get this kind of results where it's like as good as a transformer, at scale up to seven billion, 14 billion, and kind of behaves equivalent and, and so forth. Um, and, and then you ask yourself, why are you doing all of this, right? So it's as good, like if I show here, like you can't tell which one is the SSM, which one is the transformer. So why are we doing all of this? So we went through all of this of math. You know, I, I forced you guys to think about a different architecture. Why? Why not just use the transformer? And the argument that people will tell you is about the efficiency on device. 
So quickly jumping over, this is how a device tends to look. This is a TPU, GPU looks slightly different, but it doesn't matter. The whole point is you have this HBM memory, which is where you put most of the stuff. This is where you have the gigabytes of memory, whatever that is. But when you talk about your MXU vector processor or whatnot, those can only use these VMEM, SMEM bits that are very, very small. So these are in megabytes, right? So these are really small amounts of memory. And usually we think that the transfer from HBM to VMEM is super expensive and anything else is not expensive. So when you try to work on device, the one thing you need to do is you need to do an analysis of how many uh, bytes you need to copy for how many flops you do, right? So, and, and that's what can put you into two states. You're either flop bound or memory bound, depending on what is the most expensive operation. And if you think about RNN, our stuff, you know, you get that our VPU can do like seven flops per byte you copy, but our SSM asks you to do 0 0.5. So we're extremely memory bound, right? Because you, you need to copy this many bytes and you do very little operations with them. And that's very problematic and that's where, you know, it's, so, you know, we, we struggled with this a lot because we wanted to make the system fast. So, I, I mean, just to skip ahead, what this means is like any parallelization that you do with associative scan doesn't buy you anything because that just reduces the flops, you know. So instead of 0 0.5, you do 0 0.1, but like that's not a problem. Your problem was the memory, right? So there's no parallelization that will help you out of this. Your issue is the memory. So what we did to get around this is we realized that JAX was copying HT and HT minus one from the device all the time. And so like just keep it there in VMAM and it will save you something. So we do that. It was supposed to give us 0.6 instead of 0.5. When we ran it, we got like 4x speed, so they're just like, I don't know, magic of TPUs. We don't understand what's going on. We were supposed to get a minimal improvement. We got a 4x speed up. But, but this is the kind of kernels people tend to write, and this is kind of the focus, right? And the fundamental observation here is that everything is memory bound. Uh, this parallel scan doesn't mat it didn't matter for us, and most likely a lot of GPUs, if you write your code properly, if you go to the level of the kernel, you write your code properly, I'm almost sure that most of the time the associative scan will not make any difference because your architecture, as long as it's diagonal, is gonna be memory bound uh, because it, it, I can't see how, how, how it cannot be. And, and you have to pay a price if you use the associative scan that maybe it's better seen on this plot, which is you can't work on float 16 because you don't have an accumulator anymore. So if you do your operation float 16, you get huge amounts of errors. So, so this is, sorry, this is not showing that. This is just showing that the linear, sorry, the linear one is not faster, that the linear one is faster than the associative one because, because everything is memory bound. So this is just like experiments when you're just doing the scan. But this plot is showing that if you look, work in flow 16 with the associative one, you have huge errors. While if you have the linear scan where you just go in sequence, you can have your accumulator with higher precision, everything in flow 16, and you know you don't pay any price and it just works quite well. So just having this, the, the linear scan is actually way more natural and nice. We always thought that's a huge problem, but because of the diagonal form of the system, it turns out that it's not because everything is memory bound and actually you want to do it like that. And then this was a big surprise for us and sort of one lesson that we've learned. And this is something the XLSTM paper says as well and since many other labs observe the same thing that everything is memory bound. Um, and then when you go to the inference, you know, everyone says we did this because it's O1, the other thing is OL, right? So we should be way faster than inference. Turns out that's not true either. So it turns out that you do the same analysis and inference is memory bound. There's nothing about flops that matter when you're sampling from your transformer. Everything is about, uh, at this point in time, it seems for the devices we have, everything is about the memory, nothing is about the flop. So improving flops to the architectures shouldn't buy you anything. And the issue, the biggest issue that we have is if you compute how it works, you have param size, you have this formula, which is basically the size of the cache, which for the SSM is super small compared to transformers, but you have to add the param size to that cache and divide it by the memory bandwidth. And that means that as we scale the models, if you get into hundreds of billions, it doesn't matter the size of the cache because this ratio would be a function of just the size of the model. So what that means is that SSMs are much better at sampling if you work with smaller models. So if you are below, say, 20 billion parameters, SSMs, you'd sample way faster from them. If you go into the hundreds of billion, you can't tell a transformer from an SSM. The speed of inference is the same. 
And that's because everything is memory. Unless someone figures out how to rearrange computations to remove the memory boundness, this is a sort of, and this is sort of like what's kind of a very painful lesson for us because we were pushing this angle, it's like, oh, one, you know, whatever, super fast, super, and, and people are pushing it if you look in the literature outside, but if you work at large scale, it turns out this is not valid. Um, and this is sort of just a lesson, and I think for people who are interested in the sort of kind of extreme architectures and sort of the latest cutting edge, I think learning about how to reason about the hardware is actually quite useful because it's very uh, counterintuitive. So you do things on the board and you assume things will go one way, and unless you look at how the computation actually are happening, they're not going to go the way you wanted. Um, so there's a skill I've learned, and it's so something that's quite useful, and something I've never thought about, you know, two years ago, it's like thinking how the device look and how the memory goes and stuff like that. But for the SSM, it turned out to be quite important. I don't know if anyone in the room can tell me how much time I have, if I have any, because I can keep going. I still have a few slides. Oh, you have five minutes. Oh, we already overshot by five minutes. Okay, I'm going to still go for five more minutes, so it's <laughs> fine. Uh, I'm, I'm an organizer, I can afford it. Um, so there is a question of do they work really as transformers? So I'm just going to quickly summarize. They do. There is this needle in the haystack issue that people keep talking about it. I think it's a no problem. Um, it's really just the point that you are compressing things in the state, and obviously, because of that behavior, you, you're not going to be able to compress a, a phone book. And that's kind of what needle in a haystack is. It give, gives the model a phone book and then says, what's the number of person X? And obviously, you know, that's a signal that's uncompressible. You can't compress it in the state. You're not going to be able to answer that question. I mean, maybe it's a fair point. You know, transformers can do that. The question, though, is where do the transformer have the bottleneck? And they do have a bottleneck. There's, you know, that's one thing you should learn. There's no system that doesn't have bottlenecks. If they have a bottleneck, maybe just people don't know what the right test for that is. I think the bottleneck is in how, about how many tokens you can reason at the same time. Um, and you just need to build tests that do that. Um, but it's also not clear to me if retrieval, like we know how to do retrieval, like is it really the job of the SSM or the transformer to do the retrieval task? Um, just quickly, so there's other models, Mamba, so forth, I kind of talked about are you? They're kind of the same. There's some differences, that like in, in yellow here, they change the block structure. I don't know if it matters. It's really hard to tell. Like, you need to do a lot of experiments to know. Like, at the moment, I'm kind of assuming they're the same. They have this continuous time that people like, but actually it doesn't work out math-wise because they added the gating, so now that's not a valid discretization anymore. It's also like in SSM, the discretization has always been weird because sometimes taking a worse discretization of your system works better, which is very counterintuitive, so it just feels like you have these different ways of discretizing it and you don't know which one is gonna work better. It's not the more accurate discretization works better, and that's why I never like the continuous time interpretation of the system because it just feels like it's not really describing what's going on. Um, they have this expanded recurrent state uh, that's kind of interesting, but um, so they have a different, okay, so they have a different gating, but as I said before, I don't think it matters. So our gating looks more complicated and it does something weird here because all gates interpolate between zero and the eigenvalue, interpolate between eigenvalue and one. But I, again, I'm repeating, I don't think it matters, but you know, just so that you know, they do look different. So when you look at the paper, you're not, gonna, not to be surprised. And then they have this expansion that they do, so they acknowledge the same thing that everything is memory bound. So they do this like weird outer product stuff. Um, and, and I think, I mean, I'm just bringing this up because I think this is a valid direction of research is how do you make SSM to be more flop bound? Uh, but the point is, it's easy to make the recurrence to do more computations. Are those computations going to be helpful? So they do hear more computation because of these outer products. I don't know if they're more helpful. Um, the numbers are not as clear, but this is sort of where a lot of work now in thinking about architecture development goes, is how do we make these things to be sort of more flow bound because we know how to parallelize, we know how to use, um, yeah, how to get something out of it. So this is the big question for the systems. Can we move away from this memory bound behavior? You have XLSTM. I'm not gonna talk a lot about them. I, I just wanted to mention them because I heard a lot of people think of them as being a different thing. There are just SSMs. I don't know why Seb did not introduce them that way. He seems convinced himself that there's something different, but they're the same. So he has two different layers. The first layer is just a normal LSTM where he removes some stuff from the gating. We should just make things worse. I don't know why he removed it. He removed it to make it look a lot more like the other architecture. So basically, he made the gates not to be a function of the hidden state. 
I think if I remember correctly. And there is no reason for that because the, the SLSTM is nonlinear. So it's just a normal STM. So you know you couldn't parallelize anyway. And then you have the MLSTM, which is really just an SSM that has the same expansion trick that Mamba does, but they don't talk about it. They don't say it's the same trick. And if you work through it, it's really the same. The only big difference that they have, and maybe that's where the, the crucial thing is, all of the systems I talk about had the recurrent weights to be below one, and you had this sort of vanishing thing. You can think of it as a moving average. So we'll, all, everything that we've done is a moving average. What Seb does here is he does an exact average. So he just sums everything, and he keeps track of how many things he summed, and when, every time you go up, you divide by that. What that means is that, you know, if you think about moving average, you know, expo exponential moving average, and you think about an exact average, and you ask yourself what is the difference between them, the moving average is, is biased towards the end of the sequence. The exact average puts ex the same weight on everything. So he has another, a different inductive bias of how to think about the time because he does this exact, he doesn't talk about this in the paper, which I find a bit frustrating. He doesn't seem to think that this change is that important. But to me, I think this, if, you know, this, if there is a way to say this is a very different architecture from, from the SSMs, I think that's the reason why it might be, because it does something quite different. Um, and I think with this, I'm going to stop, because I still have slides, but I'm never, never going to finish them. Um, do you guys have questions, uh, if, if any? If not, you know, we can just talk. You know, I'm going to be around. Uh, but if you have any, like, one question or two questions, I can take them now if you think they're, okay. Yes? Yeah. Yeah. No, so this trend is, uh, is driven by money. So it's expensive to have this big model. So we do need small models in order to be able to service to people. It's kind of, even for us to use internally for research, right? We can't really always play with the big model because it's too expensive. A lot of these systems are really just heavily relying on distillation, if I'm honest, and sort of traditional compression techniques. So it's just basically saying, okay, we have something cool and we have this long stream of literature about how to compress architectures that's been developed over the years. I mean, this is like an existing thing. And, you know, let's take some of that and apply it to here and does it work? And yeah, it, it works. You, you can, if you take any of these huge models, you can heavily compress it. I mean, there's sometimes some prices to be paid and, you know, it's, it's not super trivial, but it can be compressed as you'd expect. You know, distillation work, quantization work, all of these things work, and if you do them right, you can get sort of these flash systems and the smaller models. Um, but it's not that they are structurally fundamentally different or is like some deep understanding, at least in my view. In my view, in my understanding of what they've done is really just taking intuition from the compression literature, apply them the right way to the, to the architecture and get them smaller. Is that any, if there's no? Okay, I, I'll, I'll let you guys go. You look like you need a break. Um, thank you.